Uh, yeah? This gets even weirder. Say I give you say I give you all the number marbles from four and above. Only from four onward, I give them all to you. How many I have left? Well, I gave you number four, so I have three. Yeah? I mean, again, I didn't just think of this. This is how mathematicians demonstrate the impossibility of an actual infinite. Notice, each time we have identical number, infinite, minus an identical number, we get a non-identical result. It leads to absurdities, it leads to contradictions. So we're trying to demonstrate there can't be an actual infinite number of events prior to today. So the universe had to have a beginning. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, objection. How then can God be infinite? Yeah, you can see how someone would raise that objection. Like, haven't you guys always said God is infinite? God is not an infinite, he's not a mathematical concept, right? He's not an infinite number of moving parts. He's not an infinite number of events. See, when we speak of God's infinite, we say he's all loving, right? He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He, you know, these are qualitative characteristics of God, not quantitative. Okay? We're arguing against an actual quantitative infinite, not of a qualitative. Okay? So again, don't get tripped up by that. All right. In case you guys didn't understand it, someone a lot smarter than me saying it. <laughs> the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. Many people, many brilliant people realize that the infinite is impossible. Another way, we're going to have to skip this one. This is another, remember, we're on the philosophical reasons to show that the universe had to have a beginning. The second one is basically saying, even if an infinite can exist, an infinite number, you can't form it by sequential addition, by one and another and another, which would happen all the events prior to the day. It would have been a sequential addition for infinity prior to the day. A couple things I want to point out is this, this point is distinct and separate from the first. So even if someone can debunk the first one, this one stands alone. This doesn't say infinite can exist. It just says you can't form it by sequential addition. Okay? Sometimes people refer to this as traversing the infinity. You can't get to today because before today, yesterday, day before that, yesterday, you get pushed back to infinity so you can never arrive at the present. I wish we could illustrate it more, but that's another way to demonstrate it. All right, so this is where it gets really interesting. We looked at a couple philosophical reasons briefly. I talked about those very briefly. Whole books are dedicated to this. I had to cut this down into a manageable portion. Two scientific confirmations that makes it absolute that the universe did have a beginning. Number one is the expansion of the universe. Number two is the thermodynamic properties of the universe. All right, so check this out. So prior to the 1920s, these are relatively recent discoveries. People always thought the universe was infinite. It was changeless, it was eternal, it was stationary. It, you might remember Carl Sagan's TV show, I think it was the universe. The universe is all there is, there ever was, there ever will be. People always thought the universe had just been here, it's eternal. But then this guy, Albert Einstein, came along, 1917. Might have heard of him. Yeah. He came up with this something called the general theory of relativity. I'm not going to act like I understand it all. This is what I what this is what I can guess. He found out through these mathematical equations that things are looking a bit fishy. The universe may not have always been here. He had to derive what people say, writing about it, say he had to smudge his equations. Yeah? He had to come up with this new constant that offset the gravitational matter, effective matter, whatever that means, to, to, make his, to make his equations work. They're kind of balanced on a razor's edge. So he was starting to find out, you know what, maybe this universe hasn't always been here. Okay? Then these two guys, this Russian mathematician, Alexander Friedemann, and this Belgian astronomer came along, and they made some predictions, some equations to say, what might we see if the universe did in fact have a beginning? And make sure you see the forest through the trees here. If we can demonstrate something had a beginning, we can say it had a beginner. Okay? That's where we're going with this. This is just a quote on the magnitude and how profound this was to actually think that the universe was changing and not eternal. So we'll put the nail in the coffin. 1929, finally we have an American comes on the scene, right? This American astronomer, Edwin Hubble. You probably heard of the Hubble Telescope. 
Yeah, so what he figured out through countless hours of looking out into distant galaxies is the light that was emitted is redder than it should be for the distance. The only way that they could explain that is it's being stretched. As you stretch light, you know, on the light spectrum, it, it emits rays that are more red. And if you, oh, you can't see the blue. The bottom one is if something's moving towards you, it becomes more blue. Again, how did we learn anything before Wikipedia? I pulled this image right off of Wikipedia. <laughs> so I hope you get the idea. What he found out is the universe is getting bigger. So think about this. Like, that's crazy. How can... So here's the universe, right? The light coming is becoming more red. You know, this is with Einstein's equations, the whole cumulative case. And now we see that the universe is growing. If something has been growing for an infinite amount of time, how can it get bigger? How can there be something outside of it that hasn't been consumed by it yet? Yeah? And people thought, wait a minute. If it's this size today, yesterday, it was this size. Right? Mm -hmm. The day before that, it was this size. So this brings some huge, huge questions. Like how could this actually be growing? This talks about how great of a prediction this was. I want you to hear what this guy says. If we extrapolate this prediction to its extreme, we reach a point when all distance in the universe has shrunk to zero. An initial cosmological singularity therefore forms a past extremity to the universe. We cannot continue physical reasoning or even the concept of space-time through such an extremity. For this reason, most cosmologists think of the initial singularity, we'll get to that, as the beginning of the universe. On this view, the Big Bang represents the creation event. Creation of not only all of matter and energy, but of time itself. At this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So, if the universe originated at such a singularity, we would truly have creation ex nihilo, the Latin for out of nothing. So what are they talking about their singularity? These are kind of a simplification of their models, how they draw them out. So this is the universe growing and expanding. If you extrapolate it back, you get to this point. Because you can't extrapolate things back you know, for an infinite amount of time. So you get to this point called the singularity. And notice what they say. Before the singularity, nothing existed. Speaking of nothing when they mean matter and energy. But we've already demonstrated it couldn't be nothing in a causal sense. Because if something has a beginning, it has a cause. If there was ever a point in causality where nothing existed, nothing would exist now. Things that have a beginning have cause. Or things that have a beginning have a cause. This has made a lot of physicists and astronomers very uncomfortable. There's been a whole bunch of different models presented to try to avoid the fact that the universe didn't begin. Because they intuitively know things that have beginnings have beginners. Yeah? So this is the, what's called the Big Bang. The Big Bang was this singularity that blew up. Okay? Stephen Hawking further corroborates this. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. And I agree with Sir Arthur Eddington here. He says, the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. These are relatively recent discoveries. This put the nail in the coffin. This guy said, you know what? If this huge explosion happened, we should see some footprints in the universe. He called it background radiation. There should be some kind of ooh, these, like, these, this heat in the universe we would find. Uh, we can't go into all the details, but he found that. He won the Nobel Prize. This is a brilliant man. Listen to what he says. The best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, Amen. and the Bible as a whole. I was learning these things in undergrad, and I went, to, I went to church. I thought, these crazy Christians, they just need some comfort. Why are they doing this? And I began to read this, and all I can think of was, in the beginning, God created I'm like, you know what? Maybe these guys are onto something. Maybe Christianity isn't as crazy as people make it out to be. <laughs> All right. This guy, he's no Christian. He's a secular Jew. He's kind of looking at this from the outside. He has no bias either way. Listen to what he says. 
There is nonetheless a striking point at which Big Bang cosmology and traditional theological claims intersect. The universe is not proceeded from everlasting to everlasting. The cosmological argument, or the cosmological beginning, may be obscure, but the universe is finite in time. And this is something that until the 20th century was not known. When it became known, it astonished the community of physicists and everyone else. The hypothesis of God's existence and the facts of contemporary cosmology are consistent. In the beginning, God created. I told you I'd give you two scientific reasons. This is the second. I knew it would be hurting on time, so let me briefly tell you what this is. The second law of thermodynamics means unless you're feeding energy into a closed system, it's going to basically run out and die. You're going to come to this steady state uh, where there's really no more um, uh, processes that can go on. There's some ways to illustrate this. Christians have brought this up way long ago because if you apply this to the universe, which is just this huge closed system, right? It's going to eventually run down and quit. It's going to run out of this usable energy. So people, the implications is, how could it have been here forever? It would have ran out and died, right? It was filled up with something. You run out of gas in your car because it was originally filled up. Something that's eternal can't be a ticking top or a ticking top, a ticking clock that's running down. Okay, there's more we can talk about there, but this really put the nail in the coffin. Two great scientific reasons to believe the universe had a beginning. Listen to this. Let's remember that the Old Testament was written more than 2,500 years ago by people that essentially contended that God told them what he did. Gerald Schroeder notes these commentaries were not composed in response to cosmological discoveries as an attempt to force an agreement between theology and cosmology. Theology represents a fixed view of the universe. Science, through its progressively improved understanding of the world, has come to agree with theology. My friends, we need not be afraid of science. Science, correctly understood, always comes to agree with theology. Robert Jastro, I love how he puts it. For the scientist who has lived by faith in his power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians <laughs> who say, who say, in the beginning, God created. All right, so you're probably thinking, Eric, you can't just help yourself to the remainder here. You can't just say, well, that was the Christian God. We've demonstrated things that have a beginning, have a cause. We've demonstrated the universe had a cause. How can you say that it's the God of the Bible? Okay? Let's think of some characteristics this first cause must have had. Listen to how Dr. Craig puts it. It therefore follows that the universe had an external cause. We'll talk about each of these at the end. Conceptual analysis enables us to recover a number of striking properties which must be possessed by such an ultra-mundane being. For as the cause of space and time, this entity must transcend space and time and therefore exist atemporally and non-spatially. This transcendent cause must therefore be changeless and immaterial since timelessness entails changelessness, and changelessness implies immateriality. Such a cause must be beginningless and uncaused, at least in the sense of lacking any antecedent causal conditions, since there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. This entity must be unimaginably powerful since it created the universe without any material. Let's break this down. He's saying it has to be immaterial. Because when you look at the, this Big Bang model in the beginning of the universe, all of matter and energy began at the beginning. There was, no, there was no matter before that. So whatever created this has to be immaterial. Whatever created this had to be transcendent, had to be outside of the universe, because there was a point when the universe was not. It must be changeless. Like, think, of, think of what the Bible has always claimed about God. Um, God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is immaterial. I am the Lord your God. I change not. Yeah? This thing must also be unimaginably powerful. No effect that we are aware of supersedes its cause. No effect supersedes its cause. If we were to come in here and this table was moved over towards the door, you say, hey, Eric, who moved that table over there? I was like, you know what? An ant put it on its shoulders and walked it over there. And you're like, come on, man, who are you kidding? The effect must match the cause. The effect cannot supersede the cause. Extrapolate this to the universe. The universe is the greatest thing that we know of. Whatever caused this, 
may just be the greatest thing.